So recently, the Abbey community watched the PBS documentary series called Race, the Power of an Illusion. And I would say it was a very educational and eye-opening experience for all of us. And I wanted to just share some of my personal reflections on the series. So the first episode of the documentary um, challenged the idea that there is a biological basis that supports the concept of race. Right now that there have been developments in science and technology, scientists have come to the conclusion that the differences between races are truly only skin deep. And that when people sequence their DNA, there's the same amount of variation between people of the same race and people of different races. Right, so there's actually no correlation between race and DNA. And what was interesting too in the documentary, they showed how when you look closely, even characteristics that seem so obvious, like skin color, physical features, are actually very difficult to define according to a racial group. And so they concluded, interestingly, that race is empty of a biological basis. Yeah, very much a Dharma conclusion. And at the same time, it's a social and political construct that has very um, real per, um, conventional effects yeah, that can be harmful to people as well. So yeah, I think we were all um, surprised to hear the word emptiness mentioned at the end of that first episode, seeing the kind of Dharma conclusion that the scientists and the sociologists uh, came to. And when we were watching the documentary, there was a moment where I had this thought, but I am Chinese. You know, that's undeniable. This thought just came up, you know. And when I thought about this further, then I realized that even for my mother, uh, biology doesn't make me Chinese. Yeah, because my, both my parents are ethnically Chinese, my grandparents on both sides are Chinese. But I remember from a very young age, my mother always reminded me, if you don't speak the Chinese language, you are not Chinese. <laughs> yeah, you must learn Chinese. <laughs> right, so for her, the race or the culture was defined by speaking a language. And I just wish I had learned about the course in, reasoning, uh, in Buddhist reasoning and debate back then. Because then I could have said to my mother, you know, it follows that your mother is not Chinese and my father's parents are not Chinese because they don't speak Chinese. Yeah, because only one of my grandparents had a formal education and spoke Chinese fluently, and the rest spoke a regional dialect. So even this idea of being Chinese is quite a modern invention. If, um, of my grandparents' generation, they identified by regional areas based on dialects that they spoke, and back then, I think it was even taboo to marry someone who was from a different dialect group, simply because you didn't speak the same language. But once you had all these different groups in the same place, like in an immigrant community in Singapore, then those distinctions started to fade away. People learned each other's dialects. Yeah, so my parents were from different dialect groups, and that didn't matter at all. Um, another reason I realized why I'm not Chinese <laughs> is that this category actually doesn't exist in the races listed by the US Census that you have white, black or African-American, American Indian and Alaska Native, right, Asian, Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islander. And I remember when I first entered the US for college and I had to go take one of these boxes, I was like, huh? Where's Chinese? Yeah, because in Singapore, you define race by Chinese, Malay, Indian, and other. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a box called other. That's everyone else, yeah. Whereas in the US, then you have Chinese, Malays, and Indians would be lumped together as Asians. Right? So when I first saw this term, I was like, what does that mean? Yeah. And I had this moment of like, Chinese, Malay, Indian, everyone is Asian? Like, that's not true. <laughs> I could see my ingrained racism come up, you know? It's like, I'm Chinese. We are the majority that holds the social, political power. Yeah? Those are the minorities. We are not the same. So that was quite startling to see, to be honest, back then, yeah, to just see how ingrained that kind of thinking is. So the second and third episodes of this documentary then looked at race as a social and political construct in American history and how racial inequality has become institutionalized in American society today. And those were quite difficult to watch, you know, just witnessing what people will do out of our attachment to wealth, power and resources. And I think all of us remember how after we watched the third episode, everyone just sat in this very deep silence for a couple of minutes. Like, yeah, there wasn't really much to say. And I was very grateful that we could bear witness to these painful aspects of history together as a community, just knowing that we were doing this with a motivation of compassion, that we wanted so much to understand how to benefit people in, a society, in the society that we're situated in, so, you know, that's where our motivation to watch this whole series came from. 
And that was very healing for me because I remember when I first learned about colonial history back in high school, I came out like really outraged. Yeah, because, you know, the way we were taught the history of the Malayan Peninsula was, uh, this is the history of tin and rubber. Yeah, forget the people. <laughs> yeah, you know, the Brit it started with the Industrial Revolution. The British needed more resources. So they got on some boats and they went and bought people's land or took over it. <laughs> right, and then they, you bring in uh, inmates from their different colonies, indentured servants, uh, attract poor migrants, start to clear the land, build plantations, extract natural resources. All the profits go back to the motherland, England. And then what? <laughs> right? So, I mean, it was very um, shocking for me that this was presented as like an economic history of the place without any discussion of ethics. And yeah, there was no, just even the space to talk about like, hey, is colonialism something we want to, uh, you know, what do we think of it? Yeah, are, what are the ethics involved when you colonize somebody's place or when you know about a colonial history, how do we hold that? Um, we were just studying it to pass a test, memorize answers, fill them in, do well. And so I came out of that um, very troubled, actually, that we didn't have that space to even talk about our history in history class. Yeah. So having this space together, I think, as a community to bear witness, um, to hold silence, to grieve together, and to start reflecting on how we make choices as a community, as a society, as individuals, um, I think is very important. Yeah, so how do we move forward right, now that we have watched this series or as we reflect on history here in America. I think the answer is going to be quite personal and, uh, and I'm sure everyone's still processing it on an individual level. Um, for me personally, I was left reflecting on all the privileges I have received in my life because of race, social class and education in the country where I was raised. And that's the context I know well. And it was interesting too to see when we watched, after the third episode, I had this moment of like, oh, right, this is what privilege looks like. I have it. I want to hang on to it. You know, this feeling of, oh, that's why you got ahead. And it was like I became the golem for a moment. You're like, precious. <laughs> so that was also scary to see, like, whoa. You know, like, yeah, if you don't have this, you'll be behind. Yeah. So that also gave me pause, a helpful reminder that um, how we have chosen to wield privilege, I think, as people are pursuing a spiritual path is to recognize the disadvantages of worldly privileges. And all of us have at least given up our material privileges for a start, right? and many other ones by choosing a monastic way of life. And um, so, yeah, I think that's where our journey can begin, just starting by recognizing areas where we have privilege, Understanding how that arises due to causes and conditions, due to our mental constructs and labeling, and most importantly, due to the kindness of others. And I think um, if we start to reflect on how our privilege might come at a cost to others, then that's something we need to think quite deeply about as individuals and communities, you know, whether we want to hold on to it like the golem, or if we want to find ways to share it, to give it away. Um, so I think this is just the beginning of a conversation that we will continue to have. Uh, but what I read yesterday in the papers uh, gave me, a, well, the news, we don't have papers anymore, <laughs> it's internet, um, gave me a lot of hope, uh, which is that there has been a protest at Fort Sill, I think about five days ago or maybe a week ago. Um, it's a fort in Oklahoma that I think the government is planning to use to detain 1,400 migrant children sometime in the summer. Um, it's been used for detention of migrant children, even under the Obama administration. And, um, you know, but now this whole topic of you know, separating migrant families at the border and the cruel treatment of the children has is, is become, you know, drawn a lot of attention. And what was very moving was that activists from around the country flew in to protest this. And there were Japanese Americans, some of whom were in their 80s, who had been interned as children, who showed up to speak you know, to share their experience of being incarcerated as children and how painful that was. And they felt it was imperative not to repeat history. Um, Fort Sill has been used, yes, to intern Japanese Americans and also to intern uh, American Indians. So the Japanese group that spearheaded this protest that worked together with the American Indian movement. So there were uh, Native Americans who spoke up as well, who said, you know, we went through the experience of being at Fort Sill Indian School this is the impact it's had on my life. We don't want to see any other children go through this. So that was deeply moving, you know, the kind of solidarity 
between people who have lived that history coming forward to say, never again. And uh, it was an act of civil disobedience. The police were at first very hostile towards them, but eventually no one was arrested. Nothing unpleasant happened. The protests went on. And I think people folded origami cranes. A crane is a symbol of peace from all over the US and mailed them to the group. And they were there stringing up the cranes as a symbol of peace. So hopefully, um, yeah, we move forward from our history, especially the painful suffering aspects um, in this way reminding ourselves not to repeat the same mistakes and find ways to build peace in the world.